All right. Hello. Shh. Welcome back. Welcome back. I'm glad to see everyone here. I saw many of you at the event we had over lunch. Uh, I'm glad you could make it. Um, this is David Bernstein, professor at George Mason. He was my con law professor. Uh, he was at the school today to give a talk on executive power, uh, including Youngstown, which we'll be studying in about five minutes. Uh, he has a flight at Hobby at 2.30, so he can't stay for very long. But I wanted to give David a few minutes to say hi and maybe give some brief thoughts on the separation of powers. Hi. Uh, if you want to know any embarrassing stories about Josh from his student days, just send, shoot me an email uh, after, <laughs> a lot of after class. Don't you know, pay attention. Um, I don't really have anything prepared uh, to say, uh, but I would say, you know, since you're studying Youngstown, uh, which I teach when I teach Con Law 1, the most interesting aspect of Youngstown, of Youngstown in a way is that the president, Harry Truman, was a Democrat. All nine justices, sort of unusually in American history, all nine justices were Democrats. I had been appointed relatively recently. I think they were all appointed from 1938 or so on. So you had a situation where the president says, uh, Korean War is on, we need to we have an economic stabilization plan, I'm trying to help the labor unions, all things that you would think would really um, be, would resonate with the justice, plus they're all the, and they're all the same party. Uh, and yet you got six votes uh, against uh, what Truman was doing. And I think there's two, a further interesting aspect of that is that if you look even more closely, the six justices of the majority, if I'm remembering correctly, were all appointed by FDR, and the three justices in dissent were all appointed by Truman. So this is something that is a little disturbing, but the president engaged in this really outrageous uh, usurpation of authority by just taking over uh, private property, and the people who voted with him were all his own appointees. So he's, he appointed political cronies and they paid off for him. Uh, and I think to relate that to nowadays, you know, it's very interesting how presidents choose their justices, and the reasons they choose them don't always work out in practice, um, but... Also, other issues come Robert, up. Robert, sorry. I'm sorry. That, 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 well, that, that, I'm, so he said, Robert, you know, uh, the Bush administration, I know I have friends who worked in the Bush administration. Uh, it was all the most, the single most important thing to be appointed or at least considered to be a justice or even a high-level federal judge, a court of appeals judge in the Bush administration was that you had to, uh, they had to be convinced that you would uphold executive authority with regard to issues in the war on terror. Uh, and if you consider how ridiculously short-sighted uh, this is, I mean, this may make you happy if you don't like what uh, Bush appointed justice would do otherwise. But you have someone like Chief Justice Roberts or Alito, they may be on the court 30, 40 years. The war and terror issues will come and go, and there'll be like literally hundreds of other really important issues. And for president, they go, oh, all is really important is this one thing that's happening right now just shows a lack of broad mindedness. Uh, but Final thing I mentioned to Josh earlier, when this case is taught, I don't know if Josh was going to mention this, it's not usually brought up. If I'm remembering correctly, and I didn't teach Common Law 1 last semester, I taught it in 2014, but if you'll read the case closely, it's not exactly how it's portrayed, because it's always portrayed as, wow, the Supreme Court really stepped in and told the president in wartime that he couldn't do, you know, presidents are not, the courts are not eager to get involved in wartime decision making. Think of the Japanese internment cases, right? That's pretty outrageous, but in the middle of World War II, the fate of the nation's at stake. The Supreme Court doesn't want to get blamed if anything goes wrong, right? So why are they willing to step in here? Well, if you read especially the dissent uh, closely, and they think this is a positive, I'm not sure why, they point out that actually the issue here was the labor unions working at the steel mills want a raise. The, the steel companies don't want to give them a raise. Uh, unless the president agrees to pay more for steel, which they're using for the war effort. president says, I can't pay more for steel because that would ruin my economic stabilization plan, whatever that was. Uh, so in the end, it really wasn't about, oh my God, if he doesn't seize the steel mills, there won't be weapons to fight in Korea. It is, will the president's economic stabilization plan go down or not? David, are you doubting the sincerity of the president's assertion of national security? Uh, I are, you, are you doubting the Secretary of Defense's assertion that he needs us for the war effort? Are you skeptical? Well, I mean, it's entirely possible that Truman would have rather have done less well in the Korean War than have his economic stabilization policy go down. If he thought that was really going to help the economy, he was still thinking of running for re-election at the time, which he didn't do. But the point is that if you, you know, it's less of a dramatic insertion of the 
Supreme Court's authority than you might think, because ultimately this wasn't really about can the president seize steel mills, which without without which the war effort may go down. It really was about can the president seize the steel mills without which his economic stabilization plan will go down. And if it's that important, the Congress could just re, you know, revisit the economic stabilization plan and take into account that they had to pay more money for steel. So that's all I have to say. Okay. <laughs> all right. So be nice to him. He's my former student. He's one of my few former students. You and John Click, I think, who are in, in academia now. So yeah, not many of us. Uh, live long and prosper. I will. <laughs> All right, David. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Have a safe trip. Have a safe flight back to uh, back to Washington. Hope you. This is a hazard. <laughs> I, I, I've fallen over it a number of times, uh, unfortunately. All right. Thank you, David. See, I gave him. Five minutes, and he's already gone. That's all he needs. All right. So I welcome back. I hope we're going to have a nice class. If you were at David's lecture, hope you enjoyed it. Uh, before I get started, I want to show you this. I don't know if anyone saw this. The question on Final Jeopardy on Monday, or the clue, I suppose, a 1957 event led to the creation of a National Historic Site in this city, signed to law by a president whose library is now there, too. Anyone know the answer? Okay. Where's President Clinton from? He's from Little Rock. What happened in Little Rock in 1957? Oh, yeah. What happened? Little Rock 9, Cooper v. Aaron. Right? So the answer was Little Rock. Of course, we're talking about Cooper v. Aaron. Not a single contestant on Final Jeopardy got the answer right. They all wound up with zero dollars. <laughs> so all of you, <laughs> not even my class a week, you just want a bundle of money on Jeopardy. So the Constitution matters. Um, I was very happy to see that. So uh, our discussion today um, is an important one. And it lays the groundwork for virtually everything we will cover the rest of the semester. It introduces the separation of powers. Now, we've discussed on many occasions why do we have the separation of powers? And as Madison wrote in Federalist Number 51, the separation of powers serves as a check and balance because of human nature. Right? We learn this insight that government is just a reflection of human nature. And we're all ambitious. We're all trying to win. We're all trying to seize power in our own way. And there's no way to stop people from trying to seize power. The only way to stop that is to check power against power, check ambition against ambition. And the separation of powers does just that. It checks one branch against the other. It checks the states as a check on the federal government. The people are a check on the executive. The courts are a check on Congress. Every single aspect of our republic, not democracy, we do not have a democracy, I don't want to hear that word, it's a D word, it's a bad word, right? Every aspect of our republic is premised on checks and balances. When those checks and balances fail, that is when the Constitution, which you know we all keep in our pockets and we keep it near our hearts, right? That's when this becomes just a piece of paper, right? They're, they're just parchment barriers. Separation of powers are real. And as we've discussed a few times, Articles 1, 2, and 3 define what are the branches. We, just, we did this last week. And take out your constitution. We'll, we'll go through it, right? <coughs> Article 1, Section 1. Right? Article 1, Section 1. Have them on your desk. They shouldn't, have, they shouldn't be in your bag. They should be on your desk ready to go. Article 1, Section 1, right? All legislative powers herein granted shall be vested in a Congress of the United States, which will consist of a House of Representatives and a Senate. What does it mean, all legislative powers herein granted? Only those powers listed in the Constitution, or those powers that are enumerated in the Constitution, are available for Congress to use. Article 2, Section 1. The executive power shall be vested in a one president of the United States. Not all the executive powers here and granted, 
the executive power. What is it, executive power? We'll give meaning to that. And we have Article 3, Section 1. It's very logical. Article 1 is for Congress. Article 2 is for the President. And Article 3 is for the courts. Article 3, Section 1, the judicial power shall be vested in, uh, in a Supreme Court, one Supreme Court, and in other courts that Congress shall create. Okay? It's not the judicial power here and granted. It's the judicial power. What does that mean? Well, we discussed last week, according to the Chief Justice of the United States, John Marshall, that includes the power of judicial review and the power to invalidate laws. The Constitution itself is silent on that. But the power is not just divided between the three branches of government. It's a common myth people are taught. The power is also divided between the federal government and the state governments. We have both what's called horizontal federalism and vertical federalism. These are two different ways. In the same sense that Congress can check the president, the states can check Congress. The states can check the president. Originally, the states would elect the members of the Senate. The states can propose constitutional amendments. And ultimately, the people in the states are those who vote for those in national office. So the, the, the genius of our framing, to use the words of Justice Kennedy, is to split the atom of sovereignty. Right? What they did was they found a way to take sovereignty, take power, and divide it in ways that had never been fathomed before. And, and the, the innovations they made uh, uh, were, frankly, unprecedented at the time. And ultimately, all the sovereignty derives from we, the people, at bottom. Not we, the states. We, the people. So I want to start by talking about the Youngstown case. And it's often called the steel seizure case. Call it whatever you want. Don't call it Shirley. But I am not exaggerating when I say that this is probably one of the top five most important cases of all time, probably the top two or three of the 20th century. So let's go for the background first. I'm assuming, again, you know nothing about American history. You've never even heard of the Korean War or the Korean conflict. Uh, uh, but, you know, this was a period of American history which you should be familiar with. All right? So after World War II, there was this little thing called the Cold War, which you may be familiar with, okay? Nations allied with the United States. You had nations allied with the Soviet Union. And there was this sort of proxy war where the United States and Soviet Union didn't fight each other, but they, they encouraged conflicts in various spots throughout the world. One of the first of these such conflicts was in Korea. Notice I didn't say North or South Korea. Korea was a country. The Soviets started to support those in the North, and the Americans supported those in the South. And this launched what became known as the Korean War. Now, it's often called the Forgotten War. You probably maybe never even heard of it, uh, because for one thing, Congress never even declared war in Korea. This was actually referenced a couple times in the decision. Congress never declared war for it. And this was a long, bloody war where many Americans were killed and at the end, it resulted in a stalemate. If any of you have ever seen the movie The Interview last year about North Korea, there's something called a DMZ, a demilitarized zone, where a country is basically split in half. On the north is the communist side, now by Kim Jong-un, uh, formerly Kim Jong-il, and Kim Il-sung before him. And in the south, you have a prosperous, thriving, you know, free market economy. In the north, these people are starving to death. It's actually a morbid national experiment. Um, at one point, the Korean Peninsula is united. And in the 50 years since the war, the average height of people in the North and South that has departed, that they're so malnourished and so hungry, the people in the North are, are smaller and shorter. You're actually seeing like, like differences in genetic birth within 50 years. It's a bizarre natural experiment. But in 1952, the war in Korea was raging. This was a, a, a huge conflict. And the United States was sending you know, men overseas, sending troops overseas, and they needed weapons. They needed tanks, they needed planes, they needed bullets. They needed stuff made out of steel. And I'll put aside David's comment for now, but he's exactly right. On the domestic front, the labor markets were in turmoil. 
the steel workers were threatening to go on strike. They wanted better wages. The steel manufacturers said, go on strike. We don't care. So this is actually a postcard I found somewhere of the Youngstown Sheet and Tube Company in Youngstown, Ohio. And actually, the, the, the steel mill is still there. It doesn't look nearly as um, glorious as it did back in the postcard. But this was a major steel mill. So what happened? At the height of the war, the Union, on April 4th, gave notice that they would go on strike. The strike would begin on April 9th. All the efforts to um, you know, resolve the, the labor conflict failed, and the Union said, we'll go to on strike. And it wasn't just in Ohio. They were going to strike nationwide. This was the United Steel Workers of America, whatever the union's name was, right? They were all going to go on strike. They could not work out their differences. Okay. So within hours, sorry, hours before the strike was to begin, the strike was to begin on, on April 9th, in the evening of April 8th, President Harry Truman announces Executive Order 10. 340. I think I have a picture. It's somewhere. Where is it? Yeah, it's at the Texas here. But President Truman announced the Executive Order 10340. Okay. The purpose of the Executive Order was to direct this guy, Sawyer. Who's Sawyer, right? Tom, no. Charles Sawyer was the Secretary of Commerce. And he ordered Secretary Sawyer to seize the steel mills. This is why the case is called the Steel Seizure. Case. He told the Secretary of Commerce, you need to take possession of the steel mills and keep them running. Now, this may not seem such a big deal. Like, what does it mean for the government to actually run a steel mill? Well, let me ask you, what would have happened to a worker who went on strike while it was under government supervision? They would have been arrested. What if there was a manager of the mill who refused to work for the government? They would have been arrested. This is, uh, to put, a, put a, maybe a brown label on it, this is fascism, right? Basically, they were putting under government control this building, and if you refuse to work, you'd be arrested. Is your hand up there? Uh, yes. In what way would you characterize the difference between a seizure and a temporary nationalization? Oh, there's no difference. He, he, he effectively nationalized it. I don't know that he actually took any of the profits from the mill. I think he wanted to keep it going, but it was effectively a nationalization of the industry. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, this is stuff that the Soviet Union, this was going on uh, overseas. Truman then asked, yeah, funny, he asked the presidents of these steel companies, hey, you guys, you want to stay on to keep operating it? Um, they weren't being asked. They were being directed because they could have been arrested for failure to comply with the president's order. They were not messing around. Shortly after he issues this order, he sends a message to Congress, and he says, hey, guys, you know, I don't think I need your permission. If you want to give me authority, that'd be cool, but I'm going to do what I'm going to do, right? I don't need you. I have my pen and phone. I don't deem it necessary for you to act this time. I will continue doing what I'm doing until this issue is resolved. Congress... Silence. They didn't say anything. They didn't say, Mr. President, you are usurping your power. Stop this right now. They didn't say, we are going to impeach you. I think that was actually my exam question somewhere last year involved a seizure with impeachment. They didn't, they didn't try to impeach him. Silence. Twelve days later, the president sent another letter to Congress. And he said, if Congress wishes, it can reject this course of action. Right, you you know, Congress, you don't like this, you know, you can do something about it, but uh, you know, I'm going to keep doing what I'm going to do. Congress said something. So Congress, you know, ostensibly didn't didn't really care. They 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 were, I guess, okay with this. But the owners of the steel mill, however, had a different idea in mind, and within hours. After this order was issued, they literally found a judge at his house in the middle of the night. 
I don't know who, you know, how do you find a judge, right? But they found a judge in the middle of the night. And they said, judge, you need to go issue an exec, I'm sorry, you need to issue what's called an injunction. An injunction basically says to the government, stop this, put this on hold, you cannot do this. Okay. So then the judge says to the government, you guys, you need to come to court. You need to come to court and justify your actions. And two days later, two days later, again, keep in mind what's going on. The war is going on. These steel workers are about to go on strike. A federal judge issues an injunction ordering the president nationwide, not just in Ohio, nationwide to stop the executive order. There's a word, uh, 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 fortitude or strength or backbone. You can use whatever synonym you want. But to imagine that this you know, trial judge sitting in his pajamas, right, gets this order. And two days later, he issues an injunction nationwide. Um, it, it's a remarkable act, whether he's right or wrong, but for a judge to do that in our system. The next thing that happened, though, is perhaps even more significant. President Truman didn't say, screw off. President Truman didn't say, like perhaps Jefferson would have, nah, not going to do it. Sorry. What did he do? He appealed it. You probably thought nothing of that, right? But the president could have just ignored the order and said, whatever. I don't care. I'm the president. You're the stupid little judge in your pajamas. He said, okay, you know what? I'm going to appeal and ask another court. Mind you, these, as David mentioned, these were all Democratic appointed judges. Roosevelt was president for almost, uh, almost a, uh, 14, 15 years. Every judge in the country was a Democrat appointee, right? Maybe some of the older ones weren't, but they were all Democrat appointees. And they, you know, they ruled against him. So they appealed to the Court of Appeals. The Court of Appeals says, this is not meant for us. This is meant for a higher power. And they basically say, listen, as long as you go to the Supreme Court, we'll just put this on hold temporarily. Go, you know, do not pass go. Do not click. Go right to the Supreme Court. And two days later, we're talking right, on May 2nd, like a couple days after all this started, they file the petitions at the United States Supreme Court. The Supreme Court sets arguments for 10 days later. So imagine, right, this entire thing started, what, on April 2nd, right? April, April, yeah, April I'm sorry, April 4th. By May 12th, the Supreme Court heard arguments in less, what, a month and a half, right? The Supreme Court had the entire case up all the way. This case was argued on May 12th and May 13th. There were five hours of oral arguments decided. Less than a month later, on June 2nd, we have a decision. I want you to keep in mind how quickly this moved from April 4th, the executive order began, to June 2nd, when the Supreme Court decided it. This is remarkable speed. And what happened in this case is even more remarkable. Now, I, I don't need David already <laughs> ruined the ending, but you already knew that already. The president lost. The president lost. After he lost, he did not say, what do I care what these judges think? He did not say, no, nah, whatever. There's a story where uh, President Truman was at the White House with Justice Hugo Black with the majority opinion. And they were drinking. And uh, Truman said, Hugo, your bourbon's delicious, but your decisions are awful. Or, or something like that. It's probably apocryphal. Probably never happened. But I, I like to tell that story because it suggests that, like David mentioned, there is a rule of law. And even though the president thought he could do this when the court said no, he listened. And that doesn't always happen. Why do people obey courts? I asked you this question, you know, more than you can probably count. Why did Truman listen? He could have said, listen, we have a war. We have a war going on. Men will die if I don't do this. You want blood on your hands, Supreme Court? You want blood on your hands that they don't have tanks and they don't have bullets because of your stupid labor strike? That's why this case is, is of such significance. Um, and... We'll be talking about this case a lot throughout the semester. We'll be coming back to it on a probably weekly basis because I think it informs much of contemporary debate about executive power and whether Congress supports the president 
or not. All right, so any questions in the background of the case? Hmm? How did it get past Bragg to the Supreme Court yeah. without actually being heard by the Court of Appeals? So there's actually something known as a petition for certiorari before judgment. There's actually a procedure to go straight from the trial court to the Supreme Court. Very rare. I mean, I can... It's only worked, I can count maybe a couple times that I can think of. It's very rare. But in a case like this, the court moves quickly. We'll do another case, I think next week, called Dames and Morby Regan, involving the um, uh, settlements from the Iranian hostage crisis. And I think that was also resolved in about a month or two. So um, Bush v. Gore, another example, was resolved in about a month and a half. So when the Supreme Court wants to move, they can move. Although very often when you have these rush decisions, they produce very fragmented uh, outcomes, which is why we have, what, like five or six opinions you have to read? Yeah. What you, uh, hold on. That's um, Paul? Yep. Paul, yes, sir. Um, I'm, I'm, try, I'm trying to get your names. It'll take a while. A lot what, of you. what was the public perception? Like, who, who, who was the public side on? Like, Truman? Or were they mad at the, the strikers? I don't know. You know, that's a good question. If you want to pull a public opinion poll, I don't know the answer. Um, if I had to guess... The fact that Congress was silent, Congress represents the people, I'm guessing people weren't too upset by this. If I had to guess, I mean, I don't know. I mean, the only people who really lost out here were the steel mill owners. The union's people were fine. They, 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 were, they were on the job, right? It's the, it's the steel mill owners that were that stand to lose. All right. Okay. Where did I finish last time? I don't think I did this for you, have I? Okay, I'll call on you. Uh, is that Anna? Mm -hmm. So Anna, what are the possible sources of authority for the president to take an action? Um, it has to come directly from Congress or from the Constitution. Exactly right. Exactly right. There are two possible sources of authority when the president takes an action. There can only be two. The first is from the Constitution. The second is from an act of Congress. So we have here Article 2. And it says here, the executive power shall be vested in the president. What is the executive power? We think of the executive power in terms of what the Constitution gives the president and what Congress gives the president. When the House and Senate pass a bill, the purpose of that bill is to give the president power. Or take it away. It goes both ways. But any bill is meant to adjust the executive's powers. Okay. Now, Article 2 of the Constitution, if you, if you uh, look at Article 2, Okay, someone just call it the page number, if you got it. Article, was it? 27, okay, thank you. Article 2 of the Constitution lists a number of powers. So if you look on the following page, it's Article 2, Section 2, or two pages later. The Constitution lists a number of powers that the president has. It says... The president shall be commander in chief of the army and the navy and the militia. Okay? What does that mean? Uh, Delaney? Delaney, what does that mean? The president shall be the commander in chief of the army and the navy. <clears throat> fluffy! Whoa! George Washington was fluffy? What's his fluffy business? <laughs> What do you mean fluffy? He's a different word. I'm not getting the meaning. It's like more of a title than like a power. Oh, it's a title. Well, what, what comes with that title? I mean, you, 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 can, you have to, you can send the troops. It has to be approved by Congress. So I guess you have the power to send them. Ah. Send them. So can you command the troops? Yeah. Okay. So the commander-in-chief means you can command the Army and Navy. Command. But where does the power to raise the troops, the power to send the troops abroad, where does that power come from? Who has that power? Very good answer. That's right. 
So the president has this power of commander in chief, right? But I think, as Delaney said correctly, it's Congress that that raises the armies. It's Congress that funds the armies, and Congress also has responsibility of declaring war. So we ask ourselves: uh, Is that uh, Samuel? Samuel? Can the president rely on his commander in chief powers in order to seize steel mills? Not well, obviously. In the, in the result of this deal, but um, it had been similar seizures had been approved during the time of war, but that was with the authority of Congress. And uh, I'm not talking about Congress. Yet. I'm saying just on the power of the Constitution. We'll get to Congress in a few minutes. Just on the commander in chief power, does that give the executive, the branch, uh, executive branch, the authority to seize the signal? Just the Constitution. Why not? Why, why can't he say? In order for me to command my troops, I need steel, and therefore we're going to use the steel so I can have my troops have tanks and guns. It just it sounds more like you know, gathering resources for war, which is something that's more assigned to Congress to raise and support. For this. Very good. So, Antoinette, what then can the president actually do under the commander in chief authority? What, what does he actually have the power to do then? I guess just initiate it. Initiate what? Well, the war has been initiated, right? There's already a war initiated. They're fighting in Korea. Why can't the president's power to wage war in Korea include the seizure of these steel mills? Because those powers aren't delegated to him. Yeah, but he can say this is part of my war effort. Look, I'm already fighting this war. Truman was commanding the war effort in Korea. Why can't he rely on that to seize these steel mills in Ohio? Where was the war? Yeah. There was a war in Ohio? I don't know. What war, what, what, war, what war was being fought this time? What war was going on in the world this time? I spent 10 minutes discussing it. Who were we fighting against in 19? Korea. Where was the war? Where were the steel mills? Is Ohio part of the war? No. Right? And this is the point raised by a couple of the opinions. Even if the commander in chief has power to the Constitution, it's under the war. The United States was not at war. The theater of war was not broad enough. Just think about it this way, right? If the president could have a war in some far-flung country and use that to justify action domestically, he could do anything. If we're fighting in Libya, Korea, Iraq, wherever it is, right, Afghanistan, if that faraway war could be used for the president to do whatever he wants domestically, then the president could do whatever he wants. Yes, ma'am. Is that uh, Natalie? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, Ohio was not part of the theater of war, so the commander in chief power not authorized military action in Ohio. Okay. So, say we are in a state of emergency, does that give the president unlimited powers at that point? I am so <laughs> glad you asked that. Is there an emergency power clause in the Constitution? Is there? A, you can look; it's not there. <laughs> there is no emergency power clause in the Constitution. There was actually a reference in Justice Jackson's dissent to a president who seeks to rule by decree. The country that happened was in Germany. The German Constitution, prior to the rise of Adolf Hitler allowed for rule by decree, where in states of emergency, the laws can basically be repealed, and the chancellor, the president, can do whatever he wants. So Venezuela has something similar right now. Chavez said that many times. Um, 
Unsurprisingly, those emergency powers usually never relax. And once you have a state of emergency, it goes on forever. Thankfully, we do not have that. That even in times of crisis, the executive lacks the authority to do whatever he wishes. Okay. So the clause of the Constitution was, that doesn't help the president at all. But what about inherent powers? Uh, that's Paul, right? Paul. What are these inherent powers that the court talks about? Uh, <clears throat> implied or inherent powers? What does that mean? It's powers that are given to them by the Congress. No, 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 no. Those are expressed. If it's from Congress, oh, it's expressed. Right. I'm talking about implied or inherent powers. What does it mean if something to be implied? Yeah, I'm not saying it directly, but it's you know it's there in the background, right? So what do you think an implied power is? Um, like to buy tanks for the for the war effort or to no, that's not it. That's wrong. No, okay. Uh have I called everyone yet? Did I miss a row? I didn't do this row? Okay, I'll start here. Is that Robin? Robin, did I, did I skip anyone else? I didn't do this right. Okay, I'll do you guys. I'll get into a normal pattern. This is a very big class. Actually, I've never had this. Is actually my biggest section ever. So you guys are lucky. So I'll start over there. Okay, Zach. What? I can start with you again if you want. No. Is this is this Zach right here, Faulkner? Okay, Zach. We have here right here. It says the executive power should be vested in the president, right? What does this mean, executive power? <laughs> what does that phrase executive, I mean, I said before, what yeah. What does executive power mean? It's the powers that are um, in section two, so what follows is. No, oh, I did well, not say that, though. I said the executive power is a power given to the president by the Constitution. But I did not say only those powers listed in Article Two. Yeah, so oh. it's, it's, it's not the first sentence where it's not enumerated, but like Congress. Are there powers that the executive has that are not listed in the Constitution? Yes, the implied powers. Bingo. The implied powers or the inherent powers are those powers which are not listed in the Constitution. Wait a minute, uh, uh, Sheridan. How can, how can the president have powers that are not listed? How the heck are we supposed to know what they are? How are we supposed to have powers that aren't listed? I mean, you know, we're law students, we follow rules. How, how can this be? Uh, well, I could see that it'd be difficult to kind of think forward and list out every single thing. Oh. So, so is what you're getting at is the framers of the Constitution perhaps left it open-ended? Mm -hmm. That maybe they didn't define with specificity everything that happened. Ah, what, what do you think? Is that Zulma? What are these implied or inherent powers? How can we even have such a thing? What does that mean for an implied or inherent powers? Um, I think that the time was what? Globby? Evolving. What, what word do you think? Evolving. Oh, evolving. Okay, thank you. I didn't understand the word. All right. That's okay. Um, so, I didn't want to say, like, comment that power is demanding something and they can't change it because of the Constitution. Right. So Truman goes in there and says, wait a minute, okay, even if my commander-in-chief power doesn't get me so far, right, I have these inherent powers, right? And then so, is, it, is that my, uh, Mirza? Uh, Mirza? Oh, okay, I'll call on you. Yeah, Mirza. So, so Truman says, I have these inherent powers, right? What does Truman claim the inherent power to do? What, what, what's his inherent power that he's claiming in this case? So what is, what what does he claim his inherent power includes? Um, you're answering exactly right, but specifically, what does he claim his power to prove? What did he do? What did the order power? And what did the order do? 
season. Yeah, Phil Hogan, exactly. You give me everything correct. I want that, that simple fact, right? The president claimed that he had an inherent power to seize and, and take private property. Okay? The president claimed that he had the power to take private property. Okay, so now it's Heidi? Yes. Heidi, does the government have the power to take private property? Congress. Bingo. Bingo. Turn to the Fifth Amendment, everyone. I'm telling you, keep this constitution that we'll be going back and forth all the time. The very last word in the Fifth Amendment, if you have a page, just call it out. 44. There it is, 44. Very last word, very last uh, clause. Nor shall private property be taken for public use without just compensation. It's right there, right? The Congress has the power to take private property for some sort of public use. And I think we would probably agree that, you know, a labor strike and a steel storage might be a public use. I mean, maybe not, but we can, we can assume that for now. The Congress will take it and they provide for just compensation. So here we have an express power given to the Congress over seizing a property. The president claims, wait a minute, I got that power too, it's just not written, right? I have the same power, it's just, it's, they didn't, the, the framers didn't write down because they didn't think of the need to take property. Oh, how do you respond to that argument, Lexis? How do you respond to the argument that, you know, the framers specifically wrote it right here, Fifth Amendment for Congress, and then they said nothing about the president. What, how, how do you respond to that? Good. How can the president ever pay compensation? Does he have a purse? He has no purse. Constitution says if you take property, you got to pay for it, right? The president has no money to fund. He has no money to pay this. So it's impossible for the president to have the executive authority to seize power. I'm sorry, seize property. He can't do it under his commander-in-chief clause first, right? First, he can't do it under the commander-in-chief power because this is not a war effort. We're in the United States. We're not in Korea. And second, he doesn't have the inherent authority to seize the mills because this was a power given expressly to Congress. Congress can take the property and then pay you money for it, not the president. Everyone get that? So the president's two main arguments about the Constitution go nowhere, right? He does not have the commander-in-chief power. He does not have the implied power of seizing property. All right? Um, is that a, a Ryan? So if the president's not getting his executive power from the Constitution itself, where can he possibly get it from? Statute. Statute from Congress. All right, the two sources of authority for the president are the Constitution itself or an act of Congress. Right, and this is the very beginning of Justice Black's opinion. Now, um, Ryan, I'll ask you a follow-up, please. Is there any statute here that gives the president this authority to seize the steel mills? No, I think they even specifically mention the possibility of one in uh, 1947. Good. And, uh, I'm, I'm not exactly sure the name of it. Taft Hartley Act. Yeah, and they, they expressly deny it. That's exactly right. So here we have a situation, folks, right? In 1947, President Truman asked Congress, look, we have these labor situations, right? I need the power as the commander-in-chief, if there is a strike, to seize the steel mill. Congress, can you please give me that power? And Ryan, what did Congress say? No. 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 The president asked for the exact power of seizing a steel mill in the 1947 Taft-Hartley Act to, to, to take over the, 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 the steel plants. Congress said, no. Well, so to Justice Black, I'll come over here, uh, Robin. To Justice Black, the majority, by the way, um, I, I, I like showing you the picture of these people because they're interesting characters. Um, Justice Hugo Black was majority. He was a Roosevelt appointee and Alabama senator. Um, his, his biggest claim to fame before he came out to the court was that he was a member of the Ku Klux Klan. And it was actually only announced, or actually well, people, everyone knew, but it only became 
public after he was confirmed to the Supreme Court. And there was this very uh, dramatic episode where on the first day of his service, uh, some member of the bar rose and says, you know, we, we do not want him on the court. Uh, and that, that, that didn't go anywhere. But interestingly enough, he, he was, I mean, he was a lawyer, but he never practiced. I think he was like a traffic judge or something. He's never been a judge. Um, and he would become uh, a, a committed textualist, right? He believed the text of the Constitution meant what it said. So the Constitution says, Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech. He said no law means no law. And he invalidated every single free speech case that he saw. So there are lots of cases in the 60s involving obscenity, where the court had to decide whether some sort of pornographic film was obscene. And they actually had a movie theater in the Supreme Court. And they would actually screen these pornography movies for the justices. Well, Hugo Black refused to watch them because he said they're all protected speech. I will not invalidate anything. You know, they all be protected. Uh, uh, so that, that was Justice Hugo Black. But among other things, he was a formalist, right? What do I mean by that? He was very strict in his approach to interpreting the law. So Justice Black says, again, there's two ways presence has power, from a statute or from the Constitution. So he said, so Robin, does the Constitution give the president this power? That's right. Does the statute, the Taft-Hartley Act, does that give the president the power? OK, so to Justice Black, Robin, if the Constitution doesn't give the power, and the statute doesn't give the power, what's the answer? The president loses, right? Very formalistic, right? You look at the statute, you look at the, um, uh, what do you call it? You look at the Constitution, if that doesn't give the power, it's a cave, right? So if you notice, Justice Black's opinion was awfully short, right? I'm sure you enjoyed that part of the reading, right? It, it was awfully short. It didn't take up much time. He looks at, okay, you have the commander-in-chief power, you have the statute, so you know what? It's categorical. This is a this is an ex this is a legislative power. Seizing property is legislative. President's executive. You can't do it. Okay. He's a very strict approach to the law. Okay. Opinion. Justice Black. Very interesting guy. A very interesting uh, uh, jurist. He was on the court for almost 34, 35 years. A very long time. Okay, the second opinion was by Justice Felix Frankfurter. Justice Frankfurter was a uh, Harvard Law professor. Um, he was a genius. He graduated college at a very young age, went to Harvard Law School at a very young age, became a professor at a very young age. And he was a very close advisor of President Roosevelt. And basically, all of his students would go on to work in the Roosevelt administration. They were called the Hot Dogs uh, after Felix Frankfurter. Um, uh, it's true. And he had a very oversized influence on the, on the court. Although he was sort of a lackluster justice. I don't mean that as a knock on him. Uh, but he was very much into what can be called judicial restraint. He didn't want the courts doing bold stuff, which is what most people want. Well, some people want courts to do. He's very much into deferring to the democratic process. So here, Frankfurter says, listen, we're not going to try and define the president's power so specifically, the way Black did, right? We're going to be a little bit more flexible. But he says, look here. Congress has a power to seize property. Congress considered with this 1947 act whether they can seize property. And Congress told the president, no, you cannot do this. For Frankfurter, that's the end of the matter. OK? That's the end of the matter. But he does add one element that I want to focus on briefly. Um, is, that, uh, is that Katie? Katie, Justice Frankfurter discusses what happens if it's been a long-standing practice where you know, every president does the same thing over and over again? For Justice Frankfurter, what's the significance of this long-standing executive practice? Good. The Constitution is very, very silent on questions of executive power. We don't have a lot to go on. I showed you the clauses, right? There's like two or three clauses that are relevant. So for Justice Frankfurter, for him, the key case is what's Congress doing about it? If the president has engaged in a series of actions, one after the other, Lincoln did it, Truman did it, whatever, right? And Congress never stopped them, then that's a pretty good indication that's constitutional. He actually says that this longstanding practice can be a gloss on executive power. It's a gloss, like lip gloss. You're putting something on top of the Constitution, you're actually adding another layer. 
So in this sense, congressional practice adds another layer on top of the Constitution. Experience and wisdom contribute to this. And there are lots of examples he mentions, right? For example, President Lincoln sees the railroads during the Civil War. He also sees the telegraph cables. He didn't want the, the rebels communicating on, on telegraph lines. Okay? President Franklin Roosevelt sees various uh, 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 military, uh, I'm sorry, various production manufacturing after Pearl Harbor. So you have these instances, right, where the president does stuff and takes property, and he didn't have authorization. I mean, we discussed this the first day of class. Thomas Jefferson engaged in Louisiana Purchase. Purchase it. He has no power. The power to buy property is from Congress. Where did Thomas Jefferson get the money from? Right? <laughs> Same issue. TJ did it. Thomas Jefferson. But here for Frankfurter, what's, you know, conclusive, what's conclusive is the fact that Congress considered this exact question and they withheld that authority from the president. And that's significant. They said no. Any question on the Frankfurter? By the way, the main one's Jackson. We'll get there in a minute, but that's why I'm going through these first ones a little bit briefer than I usually would. Okay, the third opinion was by Justice William O. Douglas. Uh, he was a Lothario. Um, he was a womanizer of the, of the, of the top degree. Um, he, he was married several times, which is not the, the bad part, but he kept divorcing his wife for a secretary. He did this several times. So basically, he, he, he left his wife for a secretary, and then the secretary got old, and he left his wife for the new secretary. This happened a couple times. So he was not very well liked by his justice. He was a very, very brilliant man. He was a professor at Yale, a genius commissioner of the SEC, uh, but he was very cantankerous. Um, and later in life, he became absolutely insane. Um, uh, let me explain. So there was actually an effort by um, – uh, the, we, we had a, 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 a war in Cambodia, which you may not even know about, but we were basically bombing the blitzes out of Cambodia in the 1970s. Um, Congress never declared war. So some, someone somewhere files a lawsuit in New York, right? And they say that this is an unconstitutional war. And they actually find a judge who put on hold the bombing runs in Cambodia. The judge ordered the president of the United States to stop bombing Cambodia. Can you imagine? So this gets appealed, and the, the appeals court says, what are you, freaking insane? No, this is stupid, right? You can't do this. So it goes to the Supreme Court. And then uh, Justice Thurgood Marshall, this is no conservative, right, said, this is insane, stop this, right? The lawyers track down Justice Douglas. Justice Douglas, independently by himself, stops the Cambodian War. Within a couple hours, the rest of the Supreme Court says, oh, my God, this guy's insane, and they'll reverse him, okay? He was, uh, he was crazy. Uh, among other things he believed is that um, trees were, were um, independent persons who had standing in federal court to sue, so that you could actually bring a lawsuit on behalf of a forest. Okay. He, uh, uh, he was so obsessed with nature that uh, he once, um, God, he once asked, he was asked for travel advice, so he sent a letter to the Secretary of the Interior on Supreme Court stationery asking for travel tips. Uh, uh, the guy, he was a loony. Um, he was crazy. We'll, we'll, do, we'll do more Douglas later. But uh, um, Justice Douglas, interestingly enough, said, listen, there is an emergency, right? But the emergency does not create power. And that's, I think, what uh, Zachary asked me before. The mere fact that there's an emergency does not create new powers. Our Constitution does not end in the face of crisis. Doesn't. We, don't, we don't have an emergency clause in our Constitution. Some, some countries do. And the presidents routinely say we're in a state of emergency and they execute all manner of powers. We don't have that, thankfully. Jackson, I'm sorry, Douglas adds that the only branch of government that can seize this power is the Congress. All right, any question on Jackson? Again, the main one, I'm sorry, uh, Douglas, the main one's Jackson, so I'm not even focusing too much on the other ones. Okay. All right. So let's move on to the opinion by Justice Robert H. Jackson. Um, you probably have never heard of him. If you have, good. Um, he was uh, a remarkable man and probably one of the greatest justices of the 20th century. Um, he actually he grew up in upstate New York and never graduated from law school. I think he went for two years at Albany, and then he uh, basically took the bar. Back then, you didn't actually graduate law school to sit for the bar. Uh, there were actually quite a number of uh, justices in the Supreme Court that never even went to law school. It wasn't a thing. 
um, uh, you would read the law as an apprentice, and then you become it. But Jackson worked up the ranks as a, a lawyer in the Roosevelt administration. First, uh, he worked as a solicitor general. The solicitor general is the top lawyer who argues for the Supreme Court. And then he became the attorney general of the United States for President Roosevelt. And from there, he was appointed to the U.S. Supreme Court. So Jackson has, oh, and I should have one more point. After the conclusion of World War II, something called the Nuremberg Trials were held. The Nuremberg Trials were actually a court proceeding to prosecute the Nazis for war crimes. So you may ask, why the hell are we prosecuting these Nazis? Why don't we just take them out back and hang them or gas them or do whatever we want to them, right? And it was men like Jackson who said, we need to prove to the rest of the world that we're committed to the rule of law, right? The Nazis, they're evil. They did these atrocities. They don't deserve our process, but we are better than them, and we are not going to indiscriminately hang them. And he actually held a full trial. And, and surprisingly, some of the Nazis were acquitted on some of the charges. I mean, they were ultimately mostly convicted, but not all of them were executed. So the justice system, you know, did its thing. But this background is important for Jackson because you have to remember what he had been through. He was in the Roosevelt administration during, during Pearl Harbor when we had a sneak attack, right? He was in the administration as we were ramping up our industry to try to combat the, uh, the Japanese invasion. He was in power as the atrocities and Holocaust were going on in Nazi Germany. And then he was leading prosecution of these Nazi war criminals. He was very much aware of what happens in a country where the decision to rule by decree very quickly falls into anarchy. He was involved in a country where a decision to give the president, the chancellor, Adolf Hitler, unlimited power to do what he sees fit leads to this travesty of human nature. And he also had his eyes open at the Soviet Union, a country that one after another was toppling democracies and putting them under totalitarian rule. So if you could see that Justice Jackson was writing not just about the steel seizure, which, you know, it's an important thing, but it's a fairly big, you know, minor deal. Who cares? Who, who cares who runs the steel mills, right? He was speaking to a different generation, a different time. And although Justice Jackson's opinion is merely the concurring decision, it's basically viewed as the controlling opinion of the court. So no one talks about black. No one. I will for a few minutes, but no one talks about black. And at the last four Supreme Court confirmation hearings for Justices Roberts, Alito, Kagan, and Sotomayor, they were all asked at Youngstown, and all four of them said, yep, that's the rule. That's what we're going to apply. So I want you to treat Jackson's opinion as if it was the majority opinion. But more than that, I want you to embrace it as a, as a work of philosophy, right? There's this urge of law students, which I hate, a three-part test. They love three-part tests. Well, you have you know, negligence, you have battery, you know, all, the, all these tests. I don't want you to look at Jackson's opinion as, well, are you in zone one or zone two today? No, no, no. This is a reflection on human nature and government. The reason why this opinion has prevailed for 70-something years, right, is because of how true it resonates. So Jackson begins his opinion and says, you know, honestly, guys, what's affecting my decision here isn't the Constitution. What's affecting my decision is my experience as a government lawyer, my experience as the Roosevelt administration's attorney general, right? <coughs> my brother, Justice Black, he's going to look at these clauses. He's going to look at the text. Jackson's like, no, 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 no. There is a poverty of useful resources for these concrete problems, the poverty. We don't have anything to look to. And he says, my experiences are probably a more realistic influence in my views. He's going based on his experience. Like, look guys, I've been there. I've been in the White House when the, you know, Pearl Harbor was bombed. I was in Germany looking at these Nazis in the face. Let me, let, let, let me talk for a bit and then we'll see what happens. He says, the art of governing cannot conform based on an isolated clause. This case is not going to be resolved based on what commander-in-chief means. Our government is based on separateness and interdependence. Autonomy, 
and reciprocity. He had a way of writing that was, was beautiful. I think he's one of the greatest writers the court's ever had, but his opinion reads so well. Uh, I wish more justices could write like this. Most of them are dribble. They are. I said it. And then here comes Jackson's insight. Quote, presidential powers are not fixed, but fluctuate. Depending upon their conjunction or disjunction with those of Congress. Presidential powers are not fixed, but they fluctuate depending on the conjunction or disjunction with those of Congress. Uh, Sarah? What does that mean? Yeah, it depends, yeah. What does that mean? What depends? Start over. What does that mean? He can't rely on the literal text. He has to. Who's he? The president. the president. Good. The president can't rely on the text of the Constitution to determine the scope of his powers. Can't. Instead, uh, Ashley, how can the president determine what the scope, what the 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 breadth? of his powers are. No, no, that's not what Jackson's saying. Jackson's saying you can't define the scope of the president's power based only on the text of the Constitution or what the statute says. Where does Jackson look? No, no, he does not go to the clauses. That's what Black does. I'm asking about Jackson. Jackson rejects the clause-based approach. We have two Ashleys next to each other also. So we have two Catherines and two Oh my God, you're, was this deliberate? Where? Where? Oh, you, I didn't get there yet. All right, Ashley C. Where does Jackson look? How is the president supposed to know the scope of his executive powers. <laughs> uh, on Congress, what though? What about Congress? You're right. Um, yes. These powers fluctuate. They fluctuate. They're not fixed. They fluctuate. They move around. And how do they move around? They move around based on the disjunction or conjunction. Right, the the you know, I put this at the end. The disjunction or the conjunction. Uh, Luis S. What what? You guys are messing. Do you have this in every class sit together? <laughs> Luis S. Um, what does this mean? Disjunction or conjunction? Um, whether they relate or not relate, but like yeah, overlap. Right. Everyone know what a Venn diagram is, right? You have a circle, and you have a circle, and sometimes just a little bit touches, and the big touches, right? What Jackson's saying is, look, let's be realistic here, right? The clause is not going to resolve this. What's the president's power? What's the Congress's power? Do they agree? Is there a lot of overlap? Yes. Okay? And if there's a lot of overlap, uh, Louise B., Louise B., if there's a lot of overlap, what does that tell us about the president's action? The president's approval and the president's, the Congress, they, they basically agree. What does that tell us about the president's action? That's what? No double negatives. Just say it normally. Without double negatives. Thank you. Yes. You were right, but I want to say it more clearly so your, so your friends can understand. If the president and the Congress are on the same page, even if there's not a statute, right? Even if there's not, you know, a constitutional clause, the president's probably acting lawfully, right? So uh, let's go back up top to here, Zach. Jay? We have a lot of same name people here. Okay. Zach, Jay. What, I mean, you're the same line of sight also, which is bad. <laughs> what should the courts do when you have this overlap where the president and Congress basically you know, agree? How do, we, how do we treat that? 
what's it what what's a judge's role when the president and Congress basically agree? Yeah. Um, yes. Well, if the president and Congress agree, how skeptical should the courts be? Uh, they should not be. Why? Close, right? Uh, so what's your name? Austin. Austin. When the president and Congress agree, they're on the same page, what should the role of the courts be? Um, I guess to nothing really. Unless somebody brings it up, you know, the lawsuit's filed, then I guess they can all Well, the lawsuit's filed, yeah, they've got a case here. The president and Congress agree, what should all the courts be? They can still check the constitutionality of the Should they be skeptical? I mean, I guess. What's Jackson's insight? Should they be skeptical and the president and Congress agree? Uh, no. Why not? Zach, can I try it again? Uh, yeah, it's um, <clears throat> going off the book. Don't go to the book yet. Uh, on no, 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 don't go there yet. We're not there yet. Okay. I'm, I was talking philosophically. Task number one. So, <laughs> actually, you know, those thing one and thing two shirts, right, Dr. Seuss? <laughs> <laughs> Awful, right? Where, where, what should the role of the courts be when the president and Congress are on the same page? They should be deferential. They should be deferential, right? They should be deferential. Well, they should. Why would the courts be skeptical, right? They're not the elected branch. The elected president, the elected Congress agree. Who the heck are we to say anything else? Right? That's Jackson's first insight. When the president and Congress agree, when there's this overlap, the courts should not be intermeddling with this. Let the political process sort it out. And then Catherine uh, uh, D. Um, what do we do then, though? Where that's not the case. What do we do when the president takes an executive action and Congress says, OMG, you're crazy, stop this, right? They pass you know, a resolution saying, President, you're nuts. This is, this, is, this, is, this, is, this is wrong, this is unconstitutional. What should courts make of that sort of action? They should be skeptical. Why should they be skeptical? Because we have two signs of power by Bergen. Yeah. There's more of an area for the courts to referee, I like the word you use, because if they don't agree. If the elected branches are on the same page, the courts are like, okay, you know what? I may not like this, but I'm gonna I'm gonna stand by. But where there's no overlap, like the Venn diagram, they don't intersect, well, maybe the reason why the president's action is unpopular is because he's acting unconstitutionally. Yeah, there's no clear answer if an action is unconstitutional or not. There's a lot of internal judgment calls that be made. But the question is. How skeptical should the courts be? How skeptical should the courts be? When the president and the Congress agree, courts are hands off. Not, not our problem. But when they don't agree, you know, they'll be skeptical. Now, the problem with Jackson's approach as opposed to Black's, Black's approach is easy. It's very straightforward, very easy to apply. But Jackson's approach, right, how do we know if the president agrees or not? Is there a public opinion polling, right? Judges stick their finger in the wind and measure it. So Jack says, look, this isn't like a, a, a either or, right? An on or off situation. There's this area in the middle, what he calls the zone of twilight. Everyone knows like the twilight zone, right? The TV show, this came first. And you know, there's that area, right? Where the sun's going down. It's not quite night. It's not quite day. It's not quite bright out, it's not quite dark out, right? It's at this weird in-between area. You don't know what it is. This is a zone of twilight that Jackson speaks of where it's not clear whether presidents and the Congress on the same page. And it's in this area where the courts have perhaps the most difficult role to assess as an institution how skeptical they want to be. How skeptical they want to be. This is the basis of Jackson's three tiers. Now, I, I didn't mean to cut you off, Zach, but I want you to understand the philosophy first, because a lot of people say, oh yeah, zone one, two, three. No, no, no. This is not about three different boxes, which ones you check. That's not how this works. There's a philosophy behind it, which I want you to embrace.
And that's why Jackson's framework, which was not the majority opinion, has endured for nearly 70 years and will be very relevant this year at the Supreme Court for reasons I will probably be discussing soon enough. So let me, let me actually sketch these out for you, and I'll do my best to explain them in a coherent fashion. Okay. So Jackson sketches these three tiers. And again, they're called tiers or zones. Um, I don't want you to think of them as boxes you check off. There's a gradient. There's a, there's a, there's a slope between them. All right. So zone one, right? In the first area, the president has authority at its maximum. Okay. When does the president have his authority at his maximum? When he acts pursuant to an express or implied grant of authority. Okay. His authority is at its maximum when there is an express grant. Now, commander in chief clause, direct. Right? A statute saying, Mr. President, you can do this, right? Her option, like, you can do this, right? That's direct. That's express. What happens, right? What happens in this first zone? The president basically personifies the people. He has his power plus Congress's power. So you can think of it as a, he has the president's power plus Congress's power equals people. I just want to make it really simple, right? He has all of his power. He has all of Congress's power. He basically personifies we the people. Okay? In this zone, right, the courts are not skeptical. They apply what's called a presumption of constitutionality. What does that mean? They basically presume that the president's acting lawfully. If you think of it in terms of like a scale, remember like Lady Justice holding the scale, they take their thumb and they put it down on one side. Saying, you know what? Even if we have you know doubts about the president's actions, if the Congress and the president agree, this is not for us. We should not be skeptical. We'll give it a presumption of constitutionality. I wouldn't see that. Okay, any questions in the first zone? Okay, I'm going to jump down to three. I'll come back to two in a minute. The third tier is what's often called the lowest ebb. And what do I mean by lowest ebb? Think of, you know, if you're ever at a beach, right? You have high tide where the water comes all the way in. And then you have low tide, right, where the water goes all the way out, and you know there's maybe just a few little drops of water by the beach. You've seen this, right? The president's power is as low as ebb when his actions are incompatible with the express or the implied will of Congress. Right? He's at the lowest ebb. His actions are incompatible with the express or the implied will of Congress. What does that mean? president only has his own powers. This isn't Congress plus president. It's Congress plus, Z I'm sorry, it's president plus zero, right? President plus zero equals president. He only has his own powers. He is not speaking on behalf of we the people. Okay. With such cases, Courts must be skeptical and, quote, scrutinize with caution. What do I mean scrutinize with caution? You ever take like, a magnifying glass and go wrap something and look at it really closely? You're scrutinizing it. This idea of scrutiny, of how close we look at stuff, is a concept we'll discuss throughout the semester. But you scrutinize with caution. And whereas the first tier had a presumption of constitutionality, you could say the third tier has what we call a presumption of liberty, right? That is, we presume the individual prevails. We presume that the steel mill owners, their claim of property is stronger. 
right? So you have the presumption of constitutionality in the first tier, and you have this third tier, the presumption of liberty, and these are different presumptions. So you put your thumb on the other side of the scale. You put your thumb on the side of the scale that the government loses this case, I and mean, the individual wins. Okay. Individual uh, uh, liberty property claim prevails. Everyone okay with that? Any questions on the third tier? Okay. It's the second tier that always, you know, students love. And not surprisingly, anytime I ask about executive power in the exam, it's always going to be the question of do you fall into the second tier? Go look at all the exams. It's always, it's not going to be clear. Because if I give you a question if it's clearly in Congress's powers or not, that's not a very good exam question. So the third one is what's called the zone of twilight, Rod Serling. The twilight zone ripped off just, uh, uh, Robert Jackson. The zone of twilight, right? So there's an absence of authority, of, of express authority, or silence. An absence of authority or silence. We don't really know what Congress thinks. Maybe they haven't addressed the issue, or maybe, like in this case, they've been quiet. So maybe the president has the power, maybe he doesn't. So what do we look to? Jackson says we look to congressional inertia. The essence. It's actually acquiescence is a word you'll know better than quiescence. What does, what does that mean? Well, first of all, acquiescence. Has Congress agreed to pass practice? This was Frank for his point. Has there been a long-standing practice of the president doing this and Congress has said nothing? That's probably okay. Is Congress indifferent? Maybe they just don't care? Well, then who's the court to second guess? But this is the area where it's not exactly clear what Congress thinks. And the courts have the most discretion to insert their own judgment about whether something is lawful. Jackson says this depends on the imperative of events and not abstract theories of law. Jackson said there's no theory of law that resolves this. This may be based on our internal judgments. Okay, so everyone get the three areas. Again, don't think of them as like check boxes. It's awful in Sinsu that there's so much more to it. That's why I, I, I resisted Zach's effort telling me about the zones too early, but I hope you grab this. Do you understand this, everyone? All right, so now, um, sir, what's your name? That's uh, uh, Jacob? Yes, Jacob, so where does our case fall? Which, which tier does our case fall into? Uh, That's it. What does Jackson say? No, no. Jacob, let me ask this question. Has Congress ever considered the question of seizing the steel mills before? That's wrong. They did. Uh, sir, that's uh, uh, Tariq. Had Congress ever considered the question before whether the president could seize steel mills? Exactly. Nineteen forty seven, Congress considered this exact question. If you're the exact question, the president's the authority to seize the mills, and what they say, Freak? They said no. Jack said, therefore we're in zone three. There's no mystery here, right? This is not some sort of twilight zone. Congress said no. Therefore, I'll go back to Jacob. Jacob, therefore, because we're in the zone three, how skeptical should the courts be? Very skeptical, right? Why should they be skeptical in this case? Exactly, as Lois said, it's a president's power by himself. And what did we already say? He has no inherent power to seize property domestically. The Constitution spells out that this is a power for the Congress, and the war power is overseas. Therefore, the president's inherent powers get him nowhere, Congress gives him nothing, therefore he has zero power to seize this property. We are in zone three. Done. It's a severe test, Jackson says, and this is beyond his authority. 
Everyone get that. Jackson says we're in zone three. This action is unlawful. Okay. All right, so any questions on Jackson? So I want to focus on the last paragraph or two of Jackson's opinion at the very end. Where he basically says, like, look, listen. The president is not without power here. The president has what's called the bully pulpit. He has an influence on public opinion. If the president really wanted a statute to seize the steel mills, he could have gotten a statute. If he actually wanted or needed his power, Congress would have given it to him. In the middle of a war, he's not going to deny it. His prestigious head of state would have accomplished this. But the power to deal with this, Jackson writes, belongs not to the president, but to the Congress. What do we make of Congress here, right? The president told the Congress about it, and the Congress did nothing. They sat there silently. Congress was letting its own powers slip through its fingers, Jackson writes. If Congress would not preserve its own power as an institution, the, the president will take advantage of it. And this is a theme we're going to see over and over again this semester. Whenever Congress doesn't assert its authority, each president, Republican, Democrat, Bush or Obama, I don't care what his name is, takes more and more. It's a pattern, an unbroken chain. And then Jackson has this line, which, which I, I, I love reading. With all its defects, delays, and inconveniences, men have discovered no technique for long preserving free government. Except that the executive be under the law and the law be made by parliamentary deliberations. Look, our government's not efficient. It wasn't meant to be efficient. This friction, as Justice Brandeis said, or this gridlock, as Justice Scalia would write, is part of our constitutional order. Right? If things don't happen quickly, that means our system's working. And the only way that this institution can preserve itself, Jackson says, is by parliamentary, by congressional deliberations. And his last sentence gives me chills every time I read it. He says, or the last two sentences, sorry. Such institutions, such institutions may be destined to pass away. But it is the duty of the court to be, to be, Last, not first, to give them up. It is a duty of this court to be the last, not the first, to give them up. What is he saying? He had just been the prosecutor in Nuremberg. Germany, a civilized country, a, 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 an industrialized Western nation. Their legislature gave up all the authority to the executive. Their courts did nothing to stop this. And in Jackson's mind, when those institutions fall apart, you're destined for despotism. So he says, look, as long as I'm here, right, <laughs> I'm in this seat. Last, not the first, to give them up. It's a very powerful rejoinder. And you can imagine a different country where a judge to write that, the judge will be arrested. Right? If you imagine a German judge said that of Adolf Hitler's putsch, he'll have been arrested and thrown in a camp. So the independence of our courts here, I think, was on their uh, perhaps finest hour. As David mentioned, they were all Democrat-appointed judges, too, although the three uh, Truman appointees ruled for the president. Everyone get the Jackson. It's an important philosophy that, that transcends the, uh, the, the, you know, the, the specifics of this case. Okay. Let's focus briefly on the dissent. And the dissent, you know, basically says, presidents have done this stuff before. Jefferson had Louisiana Purchase. Lincoln sees a telegraph in the railroads. FDR received an aviation plan in California. Look, government's subject to the law, but the president has a duty to keep us safe. Okay? There's no cause to fear tyranny here. Because the president's acting faithfully. Okay. In other words, let's just let the president do what he's going to do. 
Um, this got three votes. Again, all the Truman appointees voted in this fashion. So in the aftermath of this case, within minutes, Truman ordered the release of the steel mills. Truman complied with the order. He did not have to. Imagine what would have happened in our country, same way Governor Orville Faubus of Arkansas told the Supreme Court, not going to do it. President Truman complied. Imagine for a moment if you will, if Truman said, no, no. Justice Jackson, go stuff it, right? Go take your zones at twilight and go somewhere else. That's when the republic falls apart. Ironically enough, the strike lasted 50 days, because the second that the troops went away, the workers went on strike. Um, uh, David hinted this for our war effort was just fine. The strike went 50 days. Everything was okay. So you see here, and this happens a lot, uh, the government lies about how serious things are. When we do the Korematsu case in a couple weeks, we'll see this briefly, but the government often lies about how dangerous things are. Um, and this is why this idea of skepticism when Congress doesn't agree, I think is well placed. Oh, and the exact quote, Justice Black uh, and Harry Truman, uh, here's the quote, I paraphrase it. Hugo, I don't much care for your law, but by golly, this bourbon is good. So the president perhaps didn't care as so much about this case as they may have said. David, I think, is right. This case is about his labor policy more than the war effort. He wants to basically help labor unions out. But um, oh, there's that. Okay. Questions about Youngstown? Questions about Youngstown? No? Okay. So the major opinions I want you to remember are black. Black has this categorical approach. We have the executive power and legislative power separate. And you have to read these clauses literally. Jackson rejects that categorical approach. And he says, we have to look at how closely aligned the president and Congress are. And that tells us how skeptical we ought to be. Okay. I didn't mention him, but this was Justice Tom C. Clark. He was actually, I think, the only justice from Texas. He went to UT Austin. He was in the Supreme Court as well. And this is Chief Justice Fred Vinson, um, uh, who was on the court as well, with a dissent. Okay. All right. Any questions on Youngstown? All right. So let's move on to McCullough v. Maryland. And uh, McCullough is probably one of the most important cases of the uh, you know early years of the Republic. Okay. It was a John Marshall decision that had significant implications for the National Republic. So I want to give you a little bit of the background about this first, because the background is, is equally important. When the Constitutional Convention was first being held, there was already a sentiment that the United States needed a policy concerning credit. What do I mean by that? In order to have a national country, right, you needed a, a way of having um, a, a credit that could be shared among the different states. At the time, every state had their own money. If every state has their own money, it's not very reliable, and foreign countries won't lend to you. All right. So what do they do? They have the idea of making up a system of credit. But the question is, does Congress have the power, does Congress have the power to charter a bank? So I want to focus on the Constitution for a second. So everyone, please turn to Article 1, Section 8. I have a slightly different one. My pages are different. So just call out the page number. I think I told you to put a, a dog ear next to it. Anyone have it? Thank you. 23. Article 1, Section 8. Okay. And I want you to put a nice big star in your notes next to Article 1, Section 8. Article 1, Section 8 defines the powers of Congress. Recall, Congress only has the powers that are listed in the Constitution. The president has implied powers, right? He has some sort of nebulous powers that aren't defined. 
But the Congress only has those powers that are listed in Article 1, Section 8. And I want to read through a number of them. So, right, so the first it says, Congress shall have the power to lay and collect taxes. Good. So that gives Congress, I'm sorry, that gives, uh, the, the Constitution gives Congress the power to lay and collect taxes. That was actually a very big deal. Believe it or not, you know, at the Articles of Confederation, they had no power to collect taxes. Okay. Second, Congress can borrow money. Well, that's good, because before that, every state had its own economy. Now the United States could actually borrow money from foreign countries. Okay. The third one, I want you to put a humongous star next one. This is this is the biggie, right? This is the this is probably the most significant clause in the early Constitution. Congress shall have the power to regulate commerce with foreign nations and among the several states of the Indian tribes. You recall before this, every state under the Articles had their own economy. They can make their own trade arrangements. But this allows very clearly Congress to regulate commerce among the states. What does among the states mean? Well, the easy interpretation is Congress can regulate commerce going from one state to the other, from New York to New Jersey or Pennsylvania to Maryland. One of the big constitutional crises we'll have is whether that includes the power to regulate commerce in one state only. Okay. It goes on, Congress's power for naturalization, they have the power to coin money, now there's a national currency, the dollar, if you will. They can punish uh, counterfeiting securities. Uh, my favorite, they can establish post offices and post roads. Uh, you can imagine if you're establishing a new nation where there's no phones, uh, making a national postal system is actually, you know, that's a big deal, you don't think about it, but you need a way to, to, to transport letters and, and information. Uh, promote the science and useful arts, uh, to constitute tribunals, these are the lower courts, uh, to punish pirates, uh, declare war, that's a big one, right? To raise and support armies, uh, to maintain the navy, to call forth a militia in times of crisis, uh, to organize the militia. Uh, the next one is about uh, uh, the um, uh, the federal capital to, uh, to create the District of Columbia. And then the last one, it says, right at the very bottom of Section 8, put up another big star next to this one. To make all laws, to make all laws which shall be necessary and proper for carrying into execution the foregoing powers. Let me say that again. To make all laws which shall be necessary and proper for carrying into execution the foregoing powers. Yes, ma'am? Oh, you stole my third question. I'm going to get to my three questions, I promise, okay? Really, I had I, these are planned out, right? <laughs> Give me two or three questions, right? So where are they up to? Um, did you? Okay, actually, you're here. One, two, three. Oh wow! Oh, I forgot. That was totally by chance. You're gonna totally by chance. You get the third question, right? So Shelby, right? What does that mean? Congress shall have the power to make a laws which be necessary and proper, carrying execution the foregoing powers. What's first of all? What does this mean? The foregoing powers. What does that refer to? When it says you know, they have this power to do stuff, but the foregoing powers. What, what are these foregoing powers? Here, I've, I have it up here. All right. What, what, what's this mean, foregoing powers? No, 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 no. What does foregoing mean? And where were those powers just listed? We just read them. What, what section? Oh, section? Yes, thank you very much. The foregoing powers, right? That refers to Article One, Section Eight. And if you want to just in your um, constitution, just scribble that in. The foregoing powers refers to Article One, Section Eight. So what we have here is uh, a comment on the powers that are already granted. So, um, Cindy, let me ask you this question. Didn't I say at the start of class that Congress only has those powers that are enumerated? So what is this clause doing then? If, if we only have the ones that are listed one through eight, what is this clause doing? Good. And, and Natalie, you got your question, right? 
What's an implied power? You already said that was my next question. What's an implied power? Good. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Exactly. Exactly right. So the framers of the Constitution, we'll get into this debate in a minute about what they actually meant, but let's just focus on the text first. The framer said it's not enough to simply list, you know, these 20 things like building post offices, right? And, you know, all these other little silly things about, you know, raising the Navy. Congress may need to do other stuff in order to actually implement those things. I'll give you a very easy example. Uh, Whitney? So Congress has a power, it says right here, to establish post offices and post roads. My favorite one, right? I love that clause. It's a mailman clause, right? To establish post offices and post roads. Does the Constitution give Congress the power to buy horses and buy wagons that the mailmen can use to carry letters? Ah, oh, beautiful words, right? Not expressly, but what does the Constitution do? But all this says is to establish post office. That's all it says. Where do you get these horses from? It doesn't say anything about horses. Implied where? By what? What are we talking about? The last one. The necessary and proper clause, right? What the necessary and proper clause does is give additional powers to Congress that are implied from the enumerated powers. Let me say it again. What the Necessary and Proper Clause does is it grants additional powers to Congress that are implied from the foregoing powers. Things that are listed in Article 1, Section 8, you can derive from them things that you need. And I always use the example, to have a post office and postal roads, you need horses. You need wagons. You need to hire mailmen. You need to hire, you know, letter carriers, whatever, right? Those things are not listed in the Constitution, but they're implied. And think about these phrases, right? Necessary and proper. Necessary and proper. Um, uh, uh, Whitney, I'll call you one once more. In order to have a, um, a mail system, do you need horses in 1789? Yeah, that's absolutely necessary. Whitney, I'll ask you a follow-up question. Is it an appropriate or proper method of running a postal service at horses? Yeah. I mean, that's an easy one, right? No one will have any doubt. I don't think anyone would. Maybe you will, right? That to have a postal system in 1789, you need horses, you need wagons, you need you know, letter carriers. That's, that's easy as pie, right? So what the framers did with the necessary and proper clause, often called the elastic clause, is it gave them some wiggle room, some stretch, right? So that they can actually run a functional country, as, as Whitney, or I'm sorry, as Natalie said, and, uh, uh, or I'm sorry, it was Cindy, and anticipate things that hadn't happened yet, right? They're going to need to do stuff that wasn't clearly in the Constitution, right? They're going to need to do stuff that's not clearly there. But there's a limitation. So Rick, I'm sorry, not Rick, Nick, can... Can, can they do anything they want under this clause? Like, could they use the, um, you know, I don't know, let's say, uh, use this postal power and use that to justify, I don't know, authority to, uh, uh, you know, force people to become mailmen? I don't know. Make something up, right? Yeah, let's say, let's say they're having a shortage of people applying to be mailmen, and they say, look, we have this power to establish post offices. We're going to require all men at the age of 18 to register and, and serve a year in the postal service. Well, what's the argument why not first? Actually, it's interesting. What? What's the argument why it would not be proper? Is it appropriate to make people be mailmen? Yeah. Could you hire more people without conscripting people? How? Wages, right? If you don't have enough mailmen, pay them more, right? You don't need to go conscript people into the postal service, right? So there's actually a check, though, right? So they can't do anything they want. It has to be both necessary and proper. All right, so everyone get the idea of an implied power. This always throws students for a loop. But it's not actually that difficult. OK? So here we have the question, then, in McCullough, of can Congress charter a bank? 
Can Congress charter a bank? It is not like Bank of America, you know, on the corner, right? This was the Bank of the United States. And in the very first Congress, right? In the very first Congress, imagine the situation. The Congress passes a bank charter bill. President George Washington, right, the father of our country, is asking his advisors, is this constitutional? And on the one hand, you have Je Thomas Jefferson, right, the Secretary of State, telling him one thing. And on the other hand, you have Alexander Hamilton, who is the Secretary of the Treasury, telling him something else. What's George Washington to do, right? And by the way, Jefferson was being advised by Madison, right? So you have basically you have three of the most important figures in American history, four actually, in one room, and they're deciding how do we resolve this. Washington went with Madison. I'm sorry, Washington went with Hamilton, as he often did. So what is the actual conflict here? So now, um, is that William? William, we just read through Article 1, Section 8. It took us you know, a minute to read through it. Is there any clause in Article 1, Section 8 that says, Congress shall have the power to establish a bank. There's no bank clause. So can Congress establish a bank? So which clauses in the Constitution do you think perhaps are um, most useful to the government to explain why they can charter a bank? Which clauses? Just go through. Yeah. You may not think about this, but when you write your check to the IRS, you're basically sending your money to a federal bank. It's, you know, the Treasury. We don't have cars back then, so wouldn't it be, you know, convenient to collect taxes in Maryland to have a bank in Maryland? Right? That, that makes sense. Yeah. What else, uh, uh, Sean? I'll go right down the road. What other provisions of the Constitution, Article and Section 8, may be used to um, justify the collection of, uh, 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 I'm sorry, the establishment of a bank? What other provisions? No, I'm, uh, Sean. Sorry. He said he said land collect taxes. That's good. What else? They're all in Article One, Section Eight. They're also on the board. <clears throat> Borrow money. Why is borrowing money? Why would it be useful to have a bank in order to borrow money? Uh, so that. Yeah, right. In order to have credit, you need to have deposits somewhere, and actually having a deposit with a bank and a vault and gold inside is useful to have, you know, a credit. Um, uh, not not to give it away. The next one is regulating commerce, right? If Congress wants to have some sort of interest rate trade arrangement, it would make sense to have a branch of the United States Bank in each state. We don't think about this today, but originally, people were hostile to the federal government, right? They couldn't rely on the state bank even trusting them. In fact, this case was the state tried to tax the federal bank. That's how this case even arose. Another one to coin money. That makes sense. We can have mints printing coins in each state in the federal bank. So we have, you know, four or five different provisions of the Constitution that, you know, Support the idea of creation of a federal bank. Now, uh, yes, sir. I have a question. Uh, the text uses the term incorporate, and it's my understanding that the charter bank and the incorporated bank are two separate transactions. Uh, close enough. Now, the same. Is it used interchangeably? Yeah, don't worry about it. It's the same thing. So, is that John? Yeah. So, John, let me ask this question, right? So, we have here you have this power to collect taxes, this power to coin money. So we ask ourselves, is it necessary to regulate commerce to have it? Absolutely necessary. Is it absolutely necessary to coin money to have a bank? Is it absolutely necessary to have a bank in order to lay taxes and collect taxes? Okay. This was the argument of Jefferson and Madison. Thomas Jefferson and James Madison told George Washington, this word necessary means absolutely necessary, right? Jefferson and Madison, it means absolutely necessary. In other words, it's very strict. 
Congress can only go outside their enumerated powers only if it's absolutely necessary, right? Can a, can a postal service operate, operate with the horses? Of course not, right? You can't, you can't carry horses by, you can't carry letters by feet. But can the United States collect tax without a bank? Yeah, we don't have one today. Can the United States coin money without a bank? Yeah, we don't have one today. There's no, there's no national bank anymore. So Jefferson and Madison told George Washington, the necessary and proper clause means absolutely necessary. Hamilton said, necessary equals convenient. I'm summarizing a little bit, but that's more or less what he said. Necessary means convenient. It's not a question of whether something's absolutely necessary. Oops, I spelled that wrong, sorry. Not a question of something's absolutely necessary. It's whether something is convenient, right? Would it be convenient for Congress? Uh, oh, what was that? Is that is that cash? Cash. Would it be convenient to Congress if they're trying to coin money to have a local bank in every state? Would it be convenient? Would it be absolutely necessary? Right. Ash, would it be convenient for the court to? Uh, would it be convenient to Congress to have a bank in every state in order to, uh, in order to, uh, you know, to, to borrow money? Would it be convenient? Yeah, it'd be, it'd be helpful, right? Is it absolutely necessary? This is the difference. This is the difference. Okay. The difference is. Madison and Jefferson said, absolutely necessary. Hamilton said, convenient. Okay. Who's right? Uh, Alexa. Who's right? James Madison or Alexander Hamilton? Which, which, which Federalist author is, is right? I mean, this is like the debates we're having. Right? Even two years later, we're debating with the Constitution. These guys, two years after they wrote it, are still debating about what it means. It, it, it's a crazy thought. Alexa, who's right, Hamilton or Madison? <coughs> why is Hamilton right? Because the hot Broadway show me, why, why is he right? There's no, there's no show about Madison, my God. He was a, he was a short, you know, sickly uh, guy. It's true, he was very sickly. <coughs> In this case, how come Hamilton won? Why did Hamilton win this one? This wasn't before court. Why did Hamilton win? Who made the decision here? I mentioned it before. I don't think it's in your book. Who made the decision here? Who are they working for? Who are Hamilton and Jefferson? George Washington. The reason why Alexander Hamilton won was because George Washington agreed. George Washington was the president. He could have vetoed the bill and killed it. He sided with Hamilton. Why did Washington side with Hamilton? Well, we'll perhaps never know the truth. But Hamilton's proposal allowed our government to be flexible enough to actually grow in meaningful respects. And I think Washington, who trusted Hamilton implicitly, deeply, profoundly, uh, recognized that Hamilton had the vision for this country to be a great uh, 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 nation among the world. So Washington sided with Hamilton, and he signed the first bank of the United States into law. This is one of the great debates. If you actually go online on YouTube, I think I actually, did I put it here? Um, yeah. Uh, I'll maybe play it after class if you want to stick around. But there's a, a song called Cabinet Battle in the, in the, in the musical Hamilton, um, where it's basically Jefferson and Hamilton rap battling over the song. It's a... <laughs> If you stick around, I'll play it after class, but it, it's quite good. Um, and it actually is fairly accurate, the way the debate went, as far as rap goes. Um, no, it's, it's the, mo the the Hamilton Broadway show was so accurate, I couldn't believe it. I'm actually trying to do an educational piece on it. It's, it's, it's strikingly accurate. I, I was very pleased with it. So the first bank in the United States is chartered, and its chartered lapses. A second bank in the United States is put into effect. What happens then is a constitutional crisis. 
So Maryland, the state of Maryland, opposes the bank. And they impose a tax on the federal bank. And as you know, the power to tax is the power to destroy. Because if the federal bank is being taxed by the state, they can put as many taxes as they want on it, right? If it's a state institution, the people working at the bank who are going to complain saying, hey, I'm voting for you. Stop taxing me so much. But with the federal bank and the money's coming from Washington, or actually uh, Washington was built here, so Philadelphia, um, they don't care. They can tax as much as they want. So the question is, can the state tax the federal bank? But the threshold question, before you get to the question of whether a state can tax a federal bank, is whether the bank was constitutional in the first place. Because if the bank cannot exist, the tax question is irrelevant. It's gone. So John Marshall, the great chief justice, right, had to resolve whether Congress could charter the Bank of the United States. And to cut to the chase, Hamilton won. John Marshall's opinion is basically a repeating of Alexander Hamilton's argument. That's why I do it out of order, right? John Marshall, a Federalist like Hamilton, agreed. And virtually all the same arguments <coughs> that Hamilton put forward, John Marshall agreed with. Marshall says that the word necessary and the necessary and proper clause doesn't mean strictly necessary or absolutely necessary. It means convenient, whatever, whatever is useful or convenient to the federal government. Okay? Marshall also writes, well, we have past practice here. Remember what I just said a few minutes ago? We look at how it's been done before. If the very first president, George Washington, and the very first Congress thought that the bank was okay, that's good enough for me, right? Who am I to second guess George Washington and Alexander Hamilton, even though he was second guessing Jefferson and Madison, right? I mean, it, it's surreal to think about, but, but you know, these are the sorts of debates that happened. Marshall also discusses this idea of the sovereignty of the people, right? Because in effect, this takes away the power of Maryland. Because if in fact Congress can charter this national bank, that removes the power of Maryland to regulate stuff in its own borders. Now today we want to think about, so what, right? You have a federal post office in every corner. But back then the idea of having a federal building in a state was a big deal, right? People did not want these federal officers in their borders, especially those that are beyond the reach of its laws. These people cannot be taxed by the state. Interesting question, can you put state uh, property tax on a post office? So the answer is yes, and it's really complicated why. But it was actually an entire big deal of how you can actually put a property tax on a building that's a federal post office. It's actually fairly complicated. But the short answer is yes. So in effect, Marshall and Hamilton agree. There's implied powers. The necessary and proper clause allows Congress to do things that are helpful to execute its foregoing enumerated powers. And Congress is not limited. And one of the arguments he makes, which I think is actually a strong one, we discussed this last week in the Articles of Confederation. It said, each state retains its sovereignty, freedom, and independence in every power, jurisdiction, and right, which is not by this confederation expressly delegated to the U.S. Constitution. So it said basically, whatever is not expressly given to the federal government, the states retain. We don't have that in our Constitution. It doesn't say expressly. In fact, it's the opposite. Powers that can be implied, Congress has. So Marshall also said this is a much broader understanding of power um, as well. Okay. Um, okay. So in the end, you know, first, um, uh, the act to incorporate the bank was constitutional. The, bran the branches of the bank are convenient for Congress to regulate commerce. They're convenient for Congress to coin money. They're convenient to lay and collect taxes. And second, Maryland cannot tax it because this federal institution is supreme. Right? We cannot give state institutions a power to destroy the federal institutions. And the supreme law, I'm sorry, the federal law is the supreme law of the land. Questions on McCullough? Questions on McCullough v. Maryland? 
this this topic always trips up students for reasons I don't fully understand. But even though we have a system of enumerated powers, Congress still has the powers that are implied in those enumerated powers. Okay, I think I'm gonna I'll play the video. It, it's it's a really good song. It goes quickly, and there are no captions, so try and pay attention. Hope you can hear it. Ladies and gentlemen. You could have been anywhere in the world tonight, but you're here with us in New York City. Are you ready for a cabinet no, meeting? Huh? It was actually in Philadelphia that drove me nuts. The, the, the capital of the United States was in Philadelphia, not not Washington. Uh, not not New York, but it works in the movie. The issue on the table. Secretary Hamilton's plan to assume state debt and establish a national bank. Secretary Jefferson, you have the floor, sir. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We fought for these ideals, we shouldn't settle for less. These are wise words, enterprising men quote them. Don't act surprised, you guys, cause I wrote them. Now, but Hamilton forgets. His plan would have the government assume state debts. Now, place your bets as to who that benefits. The very seat of government where Hamilton sits. Not true. Oh, if the shoe fits, wear it. If New York's in debt, why should Virginia bear it? Uh, our debts are paid, I'm afraid. Don't don't tax the South because we got it made in the shade. Oh. In Virginia, we plant seeds in the ground. We create. You just want to move our money around. This financial plan is an outrageous demand, and it's too many damn pages for any man to understand. Stand with me in the land of the free. Pray to God we never see Hamilton's hand in the sea. Look, when Britain taxed our tea, we got frisky. Imagine what gonna happen when you try to tax our whiskey. So one of the first battles over taxing of whiskey took Shays Rebellion. You, Secretary Jefferson. Secretary Hamilton. Hamilton's up. Your response. This is good. Thomas, that was a real nice declaration. Welcome to the present. We're running a real nation. Would you like to join us? The stain mellow doing whatever the hell it is you doing, Monticello. Ooh. If we assume the debts, the union gets a new line of credit, a financial diuretic. How do you not get it? If we're aggressive and competitive, the union gets a boost. You'd rather give it a sedative. A civics lesson from a slave. Hey, neighbor, the debts are paid because we don't pay for labor. We plant seeds in the south. We create and keep ranting. We know who's really doing the planting. And another thing, Mr. Page of Enlightenment, don't lecture me about the war. You didn't fight in it. You think I'm frightened of you, man? We almost died in the trench. Well, you were off getting high with the French. Thomas. So Jefferson was in France in the Amer Re Revolution, so Hamilton was actually a commander. Jefferson always hesitant with the president. Medicine, there is in a plan he doesn't get it. Medicine, you mad as a hat as a taking medicine. Damn you, in worse shape than the national debt is in. Sitting there, useless as two shits. Hey, turn around, bend over. I'll show you where my shoe fits. Excuse me. Madison, Jefferson, take a walk. Hamilton, take a walk. Can we convene after a brief recess? Hamilton, sir, a word. You don't have the votes. You don't have the votes. <laughs> You're gonna need congressional approval, and you don't have the votes. Such a blunder sometimes, it makes me wonder why I even bring the thunder. Why he even brings the thunder? You want to pull yourself together? I'm sorry, these Virginians are birds of a feather. Young man, I'm from Virginia, so watch your mouth. So we let Congress get held hostage by the South? You need the votes. No, we need bold strokes. We need this no, plan. No, you need to convince more folks. Well, James Madison won't talk to me. That's a non-starter. Ah, winning was easy, young man. Governing's hard. They're being intransigent. You have to find a compromise. But they don't have a plan. They just hate mine. Convince them otherwise. And what happens if I don't get congressional approval? I imagine they'll call for your removal. Sir, figure it out, Alexander. That's an order from your commander. That explains it better than I ever could. Thank you all so much. Have a good week. I'll see you on Tuesday.